Hi all, and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction. I'm very excited today to talk to Dr. Robert Elliott Smith, who, after a more than 30 year career working in AI and working with algorithms, has written one of the best books I've ever read about artificial intelligence and the impact of algorithms on our society. And that book is called Rage Inside the Machine. More than this though, it's really about the dangers that can arise from trying to boil down complex aspects of what it means to be human, or what is valuable and important to you, to a simple number or a simple metric so that it can be processed by these machines and by these algorithms. And I think that this tendency to boil things down to a single number or a single metric is a much more fundamental issue and lies at the heart of a great deal of systemic injustice and misunderstanding, even before the age of algorithms comes along to turbocharge all of these problems. We had a wonderful, wide-ranging interview, and Dr. Smith was very patient and willing to deal with my pretty scattershot questions, attempting to cover a lot of different ground of what's in his book. But I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoyed our conversation. Without further ado, then, the interview. Hi, so first of all, Dr. Smith, thanks very much for coming on the show. Your book, Rage Inside the Machine, I, I really enjoyed it, which is why I'm very excited to get this interview. Um, to the extent that I would say, if you want to read one book about AI this year, this would be the one to read. Thank you. Because on, on one level, it's a book about the bias of algorithms that make decisions which are influencing society around us. But what I really like about it is that in writing this book, you've actually done what these machine learning algorithms often fail to do and put things into a, a broader context. So you, you illustrate how the assumptions, the attitudes and so on that go into designing these algorithms came about in their proper historical and social context. And by doing that, you sort of illustrated as a kind of case in point as to how impossible it is to understand a complex issue like this sort of development of algorithms and their influence on our society without these proper contexts and the necessity of finding ways to add context back into the oversimplified representations of reality that algorithms deal with. And, and a big part of that is about your own personal life and your own personal story, how you came to work with machine learning and AI and the influences that have shaped you in caring about these issues and so on. So if, if it's not too big a question, would you like to talk about your, your background, your life story and how you got into AI and how you, know, you became interested in these issues of uh, fairness and prejudice and algorithms and what inspired you to write the book? Well, um, it's interesting. Uh, f f I, I got into AI uh, sort of accidentally. Uh, you know, I was, I was a, a kid who was always interested in, in uh, uh, science fiction and uh, I was always interested in, in kind of cutting edge technology and I got a degree in engineering and didn't quite want to be a, a normal engineer. So, so I ran into a guy who was doing engineering and and uh, a new thing called AI uh, wasn't that new really, but certainly new uh, to, to most people's ears. And um, so I decided to kind of pursue that and did a master's a PhD. Uh, but then I, and then I had a career uh, in, in engineering applications of AI for, for 30 years. And uh, while uh, I was doing that, I was always thinking about kind of the ph philosophical implications of what I was doing. And I, um, I gathered some notes together to write a book uh, about the history of AI. And uh, sort of coincidentally, I was also writing a lot of short fiction because I, I kind of like stories. And I was uh, in, involved in a performance prose group here in, in England where I live now. And um, I'd written some stories from my life. So uh, when I got down to, to writing the book, my wife um, said to me, she said, oh, the story about your childhood needs to be in the book, and I was rather uh, taken aback by it because the story she was referring to is a story about um, uh, when I was a kid, uh, black kids were bused into my school from a ghetto, effectively because of federal anti-desegregation busing. Because I grew up in Alabama, and there's a story uh, about I was a bullied kid, and a uh, a one of the bus students, a, a, a African American girl. Um, when I was being bullied, told me something that was very important to my life. She, she said to me uh, one day, she said, you know, you go around looking at your feet. If you don't hold your head up, uh, you're going to be beat down your whole life. And that was a really important thing to me. It still gives me sort of chills when I say it, even today after having said it in talks numerous times. And um, my wife said, that story should be in the book. And I said, why should that story be in the book? It has, it has nothing to do with AI. And she said, that story is about bias, Rob. And, and a lot of the reason you're concerned about bias and AI is because of where you're from. And up until that day, I really hadn't put that together. And as you said, and it's well observed, um, I think context is everything about intelligence. It's everything about how we make decisions. And uh, 
suddenly the context of my own life entered the idea of making the book. And that really made the book in many ways. It was, it gave me the whole idea because at the time bias and AI was, was a topic that I think needed talking about. And I think the reason that that had come to me is probably because of the experiences I had growing up in Alabama, where I saw a great deal of prejudice and that sort of cemented the idea of these AI history notes that I had connecting to something that I think is rather important about uh, the prejudice of algorithms, which is why that's in the title of the book. Mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting, these sort of different layers of context, so to speak, because there's your personal context of how you come to it. And, you know, you talk about that anecdote, which is very affecting, but there's also an anecdote about going on a date and talking about evolutionary algorithms <laughs> yeah. and the sort of reaction you got in, in the public to that. The sort of ways in which these algorithms and these systems have been designed. And I think that's the most important thing is that they are designed by people who all have their own cultural and ideological context when they come into them. And this is influencing what people put into the algorithm, what they leave out and so on. Sure. I think increasingly people are aware now that when algorithms make decisions, they can have at best unintended consequences, at best unintended, which can involve perpetuating historical unfairness along the lines of racism, sexism, other types of discrimination. But your book is sort of pointing out that this isn't even necessarily because programmers are designing discrimination into the algorithms necessarily, but instead it's a, it's a property that emerges from aspects of how machine learning works. Would you like to talk about that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the the thing I, I start out pretty early in the book trying to make this point and then I elaborate on it pretty, uh, pr pretty much throughout the book is um, quantitative models of people have been around since uh, the foundations of modern social science. Uh, they've never, ever been very far away from in philosophies of intolerance and prejudice. And, and the, the reason those two things are connected is quantifying aspects of people is inherently a dangerous thing to do. Now, it's a useful thing. It's what we do in science. But you've constantly got to be aware of the fact as a human being that reducing other human beings to a set of numbers, be they statistics or measurements of an individual, um, is something that's a bit fraught and should be done with sensitivity and caution. Now, what AI does is it quite literally reduces uh, things to a set of numbers and then does, in, to one extent to another, logical computations about those numbers. Inevitably, that's what AI does. Uh, and therefore, all those problems that have existed in, uh, you know, quantitative social science are right, easily accessible. So, so when you reduce people to uh, generalizations, uh, quantifications, and categorizations, you're you're going to have the sort of problems that we're now seeing with algorithms. It's inevitable. Um, as you know, we've had a recent example of that uh, that's quite prominent in the news here in the UK. Uh, about mm -hmm. the A-level exams. My belief is if we all get an awareness of, of what AI does with regard to quantifying and simplifying, then events like the recent ones we've seen in the news shouldn't be surprising. Um, they and, and design with respect to that, algorithmic design with respect to that inevitability of simplifying people um, is, is what's important. And some of that design is about design of the algorithms is about making sure your data is methodological, making sure that your representations are fair, making sure that your algorithms try to make unbiased decisions about the data that they're given. That's part of it. But another part of it is it's a human computer interface problem is at, at a social level is you've got to realize when you're making quantification, quanti quantifying decisions about people, you better have the, the sensitive, uh, contextual, um, uh, you know, complex element of human intelligence involved in the loop and enable it better. So that's that's kind of what I'm trying to say in the book. So we're, we're sort of getting into this idea that there's this tendency to want to make a, a quantitative social science to turn things that are about the complex study of people and human intelligence and, and boil them down and distill them into a number. And I think it, it might be worth a, sort of bringing out some of the reasons where that can give you problems. So one thing that I think is very notable in your description is that it's not just about what algorithms include, but what they don't notice. Sure. You, you can criticize when, when you're sort of trying to distill someone down to a number, you can criticize the number for how it's calculated in terms of what it omits as well as what it includes about a person. Uh, absolutely. And, and um, 
This is one of the reasons that social scientists, uh, good social scientists, have very careful methodologies about data gathering. And uh, th this is good social science is very careful about how data is gathered. One of the things we're seeing a lot now is uh, a sort of uh, more laissez-faire attitude with regard to data, how data is used. Data is taken from, from, uh, from purposes that had a particular methodology or particular intent and then used for, for completely different intentions with kind of uh, willy nilly today. And, and that's, and that I find that problematic, but um, with regard to quantifying people, I mean, I guess the, the big example that, that I point to in the book that everybody knows about and is, is, uh, is worth talking about is the existence of the IQ test. Now the mm -hmm. IQ test is um, something that benefited my life. I, I, I went to a gifted program in Alabama which was very life-changing for me uh, because of an IQ test. However, um, the IQ test has never, ever been very far from some pretty nasty business, including uh, things like um, the sterilization of the mentally infirm and um, dividing people into racial categories based on their um, IQs and, and, and basically using it as a sort of proof that some racial categories are more intelligent than others. Uh, that that is uh, pretty drastic historical examples of the the misuse of data, and that's still going today with Charles Murray, with Sam Harris, and people going on about this stuff. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I tell you, I always say this uh, in almost every talk. I recommend uh, one other book besides my own, and and one of the ones I most frequently recommend is Angela Saini's uh, Superior: The Return of Race Science, which I think is one of the best books to come out in recent years. Uh, which and uh, I would also recommend um, Stephen Jay Gould's uh, "The Mismeasure of Man," which was uh, he he put out uh, years ago as a response to the bell curve, uh, Charles Murray's book that um, that amplified the the racial biases of uh, IQ test uh, to kind of a, a, a at a public level. We're still uh, the the thing about IQ test is this is is they're they're blunt instruments that measure. Uh, things about people, uh, they certainly have a context. Uh, people try, you know, and, and the kind of proofs you get in in various meta-analyses of, of IQ tests that say, look, it correlates to every known measure of, um, of human performance that you can think of. You know, uh, there, there's a feedback loop there. The things we're measuring for in the IQ test are precisely the same things that we as a society assign worth for and therefore give people opportunity for. So decoupling that test from social effect is almost impossible. And, and basically labeling people, particularly over a, a completely um, social concept like race, uh, attaching that to IQ is, um, you know, it's inherent scientific racism and, 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 it, and it continues to go into this day. It's really not well defended if you start taking a look at the science in a way that's careful and methodological. It really isn't. It, those are really quite indefensible arguments. So here in the UK, we've touched on this already, but we had a very recent example of this type of algorithm bias, which was this algorithm that was designed to hand out A-level and GCSE grades. The exams were interrupted by COVID. And this this whole news story was a major front page news story it happened between the time you agreed to be interviewed and today. Mm -hmm. And uh, the aspects of the algorithm's design uh, meant that it was more likely to assign lower grades to kids from state schools, particularly in poorer areas, and therefore ended up discriminating substantially along economic and class lines and racial lines and things like this. Sure. And I think when a lot of us who have paid attention to this saw this happening, we saw just a classic example of precisely the kind of thing that you've been warning against for so long and that many have been warning against in this field. Yeah. And, and part of it comes from this, this fact that machine learning algorithms, that they can only learn from the, the data that's fed into them and they can only learn from historical patterns and they can't extrapolate into the future or extrapolate outside the data set or or take into account anything that's not distilled into the the numbers that are being fed into them. So, so when you saw this story breaking, I mean, what did you make of it as, as a sort of exemplar of the risks that we've been talking about here? Well, it, it, it's a, an excellent exemplar. I mean, it, it's interesting, and it also brings in a lot of other set of uh, discussions. I had a, a discussion the other day with someone about, well, can you even call that an algorithm? Can you call it machine learning? Can you call it AI? And um, this brings up the whole semantics of difficult semantics of all those things. 
uh, any computer's pr- procedure is an algorithm. So uh, it is certainly a computational procedure. So therefore, it's definitely an algorithm in my opinion. But if you think about it, it, it is a um, it is a procedure that generated number uh, categories into which people were assigned. And it did that drawing not only on their own data, but on past data uh, a, a, in order to make that possible. That's sort of the definition of machine learning algorithm. It's using the past data to learn things that then it's applying to current data. Now, you can say it doesn't look like a neural network or it doesn't look like uh, what I read about in an AI text. But, but at the same time, the characteristics are all still there. So that these are really you know, uh, semantic arguments uh, between academics, not arguments of real substance. So here's the thing about w- what happened there is that... Um, Everybody, at least in America, knows what it's like to be graded on a curve. That's the term we use in America is get graded on a curve, which basically means your, your teacher is trying to make sure the distribution of grades fits some known shape, like, for instance, a bell curve. So you have a few people who get A's, a few people who get F's, and the, bulk, the great bulk of people are somewhere in between. Um, that's all the A-level algorithm was really doing is trying to assign people into categories from A star down to, to uh, the lowest possible grade in, in order to satisfy what they thought was the, the right outcome. Now, what happened was human beings, uh, the, the uh, flawed entities that there are, uh, assigned predicted grades and these, the teachers assign predicted grades and, and, and they're not, they're not perfect, but they do actually know the students. They're people who have actually met the students and actually dealt with the students. And we, we like to trust that they're fair and interested people who are trying to be nice. So they gave them these grades. Then what happened was, uh, these students couldn't take their exams because of COVID obviously. So, uh, an algorithm was applied to try to fit those students into categories in the appropriate, what was felt to be the appropriate distribution and where they didn't fit that distribution where there were too many A's, let's say, effectively what happened is they used past school data. So, so they used the school that the student had gone to as a past measure. Now there's nothing that more directly says, we're going to base your outcome on somebody else's, uh, results. Plus that somebody else that happens to come from kind of the same area may have the same socioeconomic standing and may have the same race, et cetera, characteristics of you. So it was absolutely programmed to do the kind of things that we should worry about in these situations. And moreover, one of the things that made it even more problematic is that um, in schools with very small cohorts, uh, the statistical test wouldn't hold up well. You know, you didn't have enough people to put in each category to make a nice distribution in the first place. So those weren't treated with the algorithm per se at all. The only way that they were treated would be over, it would be any, anything that was done in the algorithm that treated many schools. So effectively, though they got the effect of averaging over many different schools as opposed to treating only their own school. So there's yet another way that s- schools that had small cohorts, which are probably largely private schools, got treated in a way statistically different from people who went to more mass education facilities. So it, it, you could have seen it coming from a mile away that this was going to generate the kind of outcome that it did. And um, I really like to think if people had thought about the quantifying and simplifying and categorizing nature of algorithms and what it tends to do, regardless of the intent of the programmers, they would have foreseen that this was going to be a problematic outcome for the government, which it turned out to be. And of course, they've had to backtrack on it. Uh, the backtracking is only partial because effectively now universities have given out places and ha- are having difficulties like matching students with places and having to do things like offer deferred places where people won't be able to go to school for a year. So um, it's a it's a classic screw up. And, and I really do think it could have been seen coming if people were better aware of the limitations of algorithms that are inherent. I mean, it, it again, as you say, could have been seen coming. And reading your book, reading other books in this field, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction is, is another yeah, one by Kathy O'Neill, one. of course. And there's plenty yeah. of other people who have written on this. It, it, it's classic in so many ways, but but that's in some ways it's, it's, it's a good object lesson for the problems that show up here. So one of the aspects of the problem that came up that's very illustrative of the trouble with algorithmic decision making is this lack of interpretability. You can't ask the algorithm why it's decided that you in particular should get a U and not a B or 
you know, the another example that I talked about on the show before is the higher view algorithm that's like sort of hiring employment hiring software, yeah, yeah. which films people and judges their body language and does a kind of like digital phrenology on them to see if yes. they're, yeah. they're worthy and matching up to the employees of the uh, company that are there already. And it, it can't give you an explanation, not just because the system is opaque, but because there's not an explanation sort of doesn't exist beyond, well, we crunch the numbers and, and right. we've ended up giving you this number. Right. Um, so in the, in the book, you sort of quote someone saying machine learning has become alchemy. Yes. So, I mean, how, how and why is it that we're, we're turning over decision-making process uh, to these, these black boxes whose, whose process we can't explain and where we can't get an explanation of how they've come to the decision out of the other end? And do you sort of see any hope for uh, explainable algorithms to come along and save us? Uh, one of the terms I've been using for a lot of machine learning algorithms, particularly things like deep learning and, and neural networks and things like that, is uh, sometimes I just call them intractable statistical inference. Because what they're doing is they're they're doing statistical inference, but in a way that is is uh, really becomes a great big black box. Now, the the thing about my experience with with uh, these kind of algorithms is, if you want them to do a technical task, taking say a, a bunch of photographs and picking out all the airplanes, uh, you're going to get a more powerful algorithm the more internally flexible it is, the more uh, complicated the guts are, because it gives it lots of degrees of freedom and lots of ways to try to find different ways to generalize. Uh, on the other hand, that also hides a lot of the, the decision making they're making. So some of the, the, there's a inverse relationship between the power, generalization power of an al algorithm and its explainability in general, in my experience. Now, are there going to be ways to make that better? Sure. There are going to be ways, people are going to figure out ways to make that better. But inherently, uh, complicated things can't be turned into simple things. Uh, that that's one of the things we know from complexity science is, is there are things that are that are uh, indecipherably complex. So if you're dealing with things that are highly complex, you're going to end up with um, with algorithms that basically are in themselves highly complex internally and therefore become sort of black boxes. So I think that that will make more explainable AI, but there are inherent limitations uh, to explainability and um, you know, there are issues here that become uh, co-involved. Uh, all machine learning algorithms depend on the data that they're given. Uh, the more data you give them, and that's not just more data uh, longitudinally, but lat uh, latitudinally as well. It, you know, you give them more features and more data, the more stuff you might be able to learn. On the other hand, the more features you give them, the more likelihood that it's going to use those features in some ways you can't predict. And if the data happen to be methodologically drawn from, uh, from a bias process, which happens all the time because we're human beings, we design, design processes with our own um, uh, unconscious biases, then effectively the biases extracted by the algorithm could end up being completely hidden inside a black box and only be discovered upon impact only just be discovered when they cause something in society that we, we find uh, unacceptable or unfair uh, because of the complex nature of, of, um, of human society. I think this, this point you make that the more complex a task you try and set an algorithm to, the more sort of degrees of freedom you have in your statistical analysis, the, yeah. the more complicated it is to come up with what you might call physical interpretations of each different right. degree of freedom. Because if you have, we think about um, how these neural networks work, for example, and you have layers and layers of neurons. And so what they're sort of doing is you have statistical weights which connect different layers to each other. And if you have a yeah. few layers, I guess you can start to think logically about what the connections mean in, in symbolic rather than numerical terms. And you can yeah. think about what they actually signify. But when you get to the number of layers you need to have complex problems, you, you can't give an explanation beyond the numerical and your sort of hope of drawing logic back out of it again is, is lost. Does yeah. that sound fair? That's fair. And, and some of the most interesting things I think that happen in using AI techniques is, is um, you make this model with lots of layers and lots of degrees of freedom in exactly the way you described. You run it on some data and it, it performs nicely on some things and badly on others. And then you begin looking at the internals of it and you really don't know what's going on. But occasionally something will jump out at you and you'll say, aha, 
I see what it's doing. And in fact, when you see that aha moment, you, you know, a human being a lot of times then can throw away the neural network and basically say, oh, here was, I just discovered something that was a good decision making thing, right? That it was actually very simple, not very complicated. And this happens all the time in using these techniques. However, the flip side is on many, 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 in many, many, many cases, you uh, run the algorithm, it learns, it does pretty well on, on your testing sample. You do, you know, out of sample testing, it looks okay. And um, then you try to figure out what it's doing. And in fact, you just can't figure it out. The, the, the degree to which uh, explainability exists is so low. So uh, these are just the experiences of being a person who's, who's dealt with AI algorithms. Uh, and hey, it's fine to have methods that are black boxes if they're doing things like uh, classifying bolts uh, coming off an assembly line as to whether they are good bolts or bad bolts. But when mm -hmm. you have it classifying whether a student gets a place at one university or another, then or, or if somebody gets a uh, longer jail sentence than another person, or if someone should have police patrolling their neighborhood uh, versus not, then you get into things where having a black box is is really uh, unacceptable. So an, another major issue that really comes out from this and this particular issue is the idea of human accountability. If an algorithm discriminates against someone, do you blame the programmer? And what's your sort of recourse to redress your grievances? And I think this is part of the the trauma that a lot of these kids have gone through when they've had their grades assigned. It's like they don't even know who to blame for the yeah. for the question. And well, apparently the government has <laughs> the government Sorry. has no idea who to blame either. I mean, you know, the the the. Uh... The, the blames have flown around in all sorts of directions. And, uh, you know, uh, certainly the philosophy of uh, the buck stopping at the top hasn't been followed. But, um, you know, uh, that that's the way I thought government was supposed to work is that the guy at the top basically fell on his sword when, when the organization fails. But that doesn't seem to be what's happened in this case. But... Um, it, it, it's worse. It's worse than what you describe in the, in, in the use of algorithms in general, because... First of all, do you blame the programmer? Do you blame the data provider? Do you blame the um, the data gatherer? Uh, and mm -hmm. in m very complex systems where you might have multiple components working that are designed by different people and where it's integrating data sets from more than one place, which data gatherer, which data processor, which algorithmist do you blame? Uh, becomes a really complicated issue. And um, even with uh, non-AI systems, even with technological systems uh, that are like batteries and wires connected to actuators in an airplane, when something fails, the chain of blame requires, uh, it re requires um, judicial process effectively you have to people yeah. get sued and you it takes a long time to figure out who is to blame uh when you start dealing with machine learning type algorithms that have learned from data and you deal with chains of black box algorithms ai algorithms then assigning blame becomes really really very difficult and this is a whole uh pandora's box of problems that hasn't been faced yet with regard to the use of this kind of technology and do you think that we're we're letting people get away with coding algorithms that that are doing things that essentially we wouldn't let humans do and we wouldn't stand for humans doing but we're sort of willing to accept it because we don't view it as a responsibility question of if you have an algorithm that's making decisions and you don't understand how it works or you haven't checked for bias you're kind of irresponsible to put it in that position. And, you know, I often think about this in terms of advertising. I mean, if you showed up outside a shuttered factory advertising alcohol, payday loans and gambling companies, people would probably consider that to be pretty shady practice. Mm. But when the algorithm <laughs> identifies people who have recently been made unemployed and advertises those same things to them, it's sort of there's less accountability and there's less of a tendency to to view that as someone to blame, I think. I mean, how can we sort of get accountability back for doing these things? That's a that's an excellent point, by the way. I really love that metaphor. Um, and I think that's exactly what's going on. Um, you know, obviously in the political sphere, we have this sort of targeting that goes on that can be quite exploitative, as we saw in the Cambridge Analytical scandal. There's a crisis of regulation in the world right now uh, where technolo technology has gotten ahead of law. Um, I think that in many ways, it's a failure to identify companies for what they are. Um, Facebook 
Google, um, uh, Bing, Twitter, uh, they're media companies. Mm -hmm. That's what they are. They're media companies. They're just different kinds of media companies. And we used to have media regulation. Uh, unfortunately, media regulation is, is degraded dramatically over the past 20 years. Even Pre-internet, it started to degrade. But the thing is, is um, in the 1940s, it was being determined that putting all the control of media in a few hands required government to step in. Uh, to basically regulate. And I do believe that's what's going to happen. And we are seeing good moves on that account. There's good stuff going on in the European Union. There's good stuff going on in Australia. Um, there's, uh, you know, there, there are some governments that are really paying attention and trying to come up with new frameworks. And it will require new frameworks because these aren't, the, 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 this isn't your granddad's media, but it is media. And, and the same thing goes for, um, uh, responsibility in advertising. Uh, the, the thing you bring up is, is very pointed. And, and I think, you know, we have the watershed, you know, the watershed in, in Britain for, if, for listeners who aren't um, British here in Britain, uh, there's this thing called the watershed. So before a certain hour uh, of broadcasting in the evening, you have restricted things you can advertise. You can't advertise things that will uh, hurt children and, uh, you know, that might draw children into some situation you, they're, they're, and not just advertise, but things you could put in programming. Then after the watershed, you can do all sorts of stuff, right? So we, we mm -hmm. have this boundary. Uh, we need new boundaries, but they're not boundaries in evening time. They're boundaries in, 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 in a more complex social order that, that we've really got to look at more carefully. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I turn back to the fairness doctrine, which is the way American media was regulated up until the 1980s, and uh, the the you know the it, it does it, it was trying to do exactly what was on the tin. It was supposed to ensure fairness. Uh, we gave up on the idea of a commission of human beings trying to ensure fairness in media, and with the idea that broadcasters had a responsibility to be fair, we basically abandoned that in favor of effectively. Uh, there being lots and lots of broadcasters and each of them interpreting what fair means their own way. Uh, well, they don't even have to be fair. They have no, they have no responsibility to be fair. And then the consumer Although they can call themselves fair and balanced if they like, wish. Exactly. And then you're, you're referring to the right thing there. And, and, and the thing is, is that um, it's the marketplace of ideas and it's the idea that, that the market will out. If you give people enough alternatives, they'll go out and find truth themselves. Well, it's pretty clear that in the past 30 years, that has not, been the outcome. Uh, and the, the thing is, is we need a new kind of regulation. And ultimately, it will have to enforce upon all companies that provide major public infrastructure services, like the ones I've listed already, that they have value, social values they're responsible for adhering to. And they'll have to be held to those. Now, I personally think that once that's done, then there's a great opportunity for people who write algorithms to try to help you know, uh, you know, to try to help do that in, in a responsible way. The algorithms aren't going to make all the decisions about complex human concepts like fairness for us, but they can, if, if the corporation is charged with the idea that they have to maintain these standards, at least they'll be de designing algorithms that are in the right space, that are trying to do what their values are right now. Um, their large algorithms are largely designed to maximize profit. Of course they are. That's the way our systems work. And when the ultimate responsibility of a corporation is to its shareholders, to deliver value for its shareholders, you can't blame them for making their algorithmic arms do that in the world. You know, that they're doing what the gov our government, what we as people have told them to do. Uh, corporate responsibility is a big issue that needs to be addressed, but it particularly needs to be addressed with regard to these algorithmic hands and arms and eyes that reach out into the public, because they're simplifying, generalizing robots that, um, that can do really harmful things at light speed and at global scale. And so we can no longer have a case where people can simply just throw up their hands and say, well, uh, fair cop gov, we don't know what our algorithm is doing. You know, we can't control it yeah. um, if it recommends various different things to people. I mean, OK, so we, we've we've touched on this a little bit. Uh, it's sort of unavoidable in, in the year that we're in at the moment. But this discussion of algorithms as it relates to social media, the big 
social media, they call themselves platforms. I guess you would want to call them publishers. Yes. Um, you know, YouTube's algorithm tells us to watch 700 million hours of content worldwide every single day. So inevitably tweaks in its design are going to shape society because they're mm -hmm. shaping the content that people can talk about. There's been lots written about how these algorithms direct people to more and more radical uh, content uh, and are sort of contributing to political polarization in a, a situation in the run-up to the 2020 presidential election in sure. the US, where the only thing people can agree on is that the other side of the aisle have lost their collective minds, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. It's sort of being aided and abetted by these algorithms, um, irresponsibly deployed. One, how do you kind of view the impact of these these algorithms are having on society? And two, how can we rein in, or how would we hope to rein in the, the more harmful things that they're doing to us at the moment. I think what they're doing is they are leading to the kind of polarization you're talking about. I mean, uh, this the, the YouTube example is a great one, and, and most people can can run this experiment for themselves, is um, go look for something that is uh, political, you know, a, a political ad, and then, um, or a political statement on, on YouTube, and then look at the recommendations and click through on something that looks, you know, uh, vaguely related and keep doing this, iterate this process. And in general, if, if, if you're, if you're looking for a particular topic, let's say we're looking for a topic on, um, uh, immigration policy right? Immigration policy. And, and you, 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 you're, you're saying we need stronger immigration. And you basically start looking for videos that, that are advocating stronger immigration. If you iterate the process in the recommendation engine by basically looking at the recommend engines, most people fairly quickly, and I'm, I'm talking in five or six, seven clicks throughs, will get to content that is, becomes really quite questionable, that, that, that is really extremist content. And most people would agree was extreme. Uh, why does that happen? Well, why is this happening? Well, the thing is, is that the view that algorithms have of you as a consumer and of the content itself is highly simplifying and generalizing. So if you iterate what its view is over and over again, it's going to drive you into simpler and more generalized territory and simpler, and more chair and generalized territory is in general going to become more and more extreme when the views expressed are about people. So that that's the inevitability. So, so how do we, how do we stop this? How do we change it? I do think it's about ultimately corporations have to have values that, that 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 basically lead us to a better social place, and that's true. But let's assume that that corporations feel that this is in their best interest uh, with regard to the incentives they're given by society. How do they do it technically? Well, I think one of the ways you do it is um, realizing that algorithms are simplifying and generalizing engines, and then basically say. The idea of personalization, the idea of basically saying, I'm going to give you the thing best for you, personalized based on my simplified, generalized view of you, may not be a good thing. Maybe it's a better thing to say, I'm going to give you stuff that I think is personalized to you, and I'm going to give you stuff that I think is adjacent in many, many different directions that isn't what you're looking for, but has some vague adjacency and may have opposition to what you're looking for and may have elements of what you're looking for and elements. So in other words, a, a diversity of information becomes a value of the algorithm. The algorithm is trying to not just give you something personalized, but give you something diverse. At the moment, these algorithms are essentially, they try and predict what will keep you watching YouTube for the longest, because that's the thing that keeps you right. watching YouTube, watching adverts and gives revenue to Alphabet. Sure. And, and uh, you know, on other platforms, it may be, uh, giving you content that directs you ultimately towards advertising products and where the advertisers mm -hmm. are paying for the ads. You know, effectively, uh, advertisers for many, many years have been trying to use demographics to target advertising effectively to get more sales. And, and you know, they, they were able to show numbers where that, that basically works well. So effectively, their incentive is to place you into demographic categories. Those categories are inherently simplifying. So, so effectively, the the standards of these algorithms are about uh, generating more eyeball time, generating more clicks, and ultimately generating more sales. Uh, and you know, shit, hey, that's their business model. That they got to make a living, right? And um, but I will say this: I think that the first provider, the first major data provider 
who basically begins to say to people, look, we're not going to personalize all our content to you. We're going to, at your discretion, you, the user, can decide whether you want this or not. We're going to give you some stuff you didn't expect. We're going to give you stuff that maybe goes against your views. Uh, we're going to give you stuff that, that's a bit off, uh, you know, a bit oblique to what you expect. I think the first data provider that, that provides that and says, we're going to use AI to do it, and we're, you're going to use technology to make this better, um, and let people opt in, I think are going to have a, a marketplace advantage. Uh, but I think it's going to take, it, it's a risk. Uh, you, you know, it, it's, a, it's a risk against the current business model. So it's going to take somebody who's pretty forward looking to try to do that. Uh, change your settings to a different point of view rather than feed me more of what I know or what you know me to like. I think that's an interesting point. Right, right. I mean, I would tolerate getting, um, I don't want to see any extreme um, content in the in a direction that's different from my own political views. But I certainly well-informed content that doesn't quite agree with me, I would find interesting. But the way algorithms work now, they're not going to give <laughs> me that. They're, that they're, they're not programmed to give me that. And um, and you have to do a lot of work to seek it out for yourself. You do. And, and, and because of the amplification effects, uh, I talk in my book about this, about some studies I've done with some students, because of the amplification effects that exist, um, uh, within systems like Twitter and YouTube, Facebook, Google, etc., it be content gets more and more ramped up and more and more extreme because it's what works in the algorithms. Like, like if you generate a a headline, uh, if you're if you're curating headline pieces that get click throughs because they're extreme those pieces are going to get promoted. So headlines become more and more extreme. And this is the issue, isn't it? It says humans are being made to behave like algorithms in the sense that an algorithm, you know, a way that it might optimize is sort of looking around, seeing uh, which directions it can travel in to maximize whatever it's trying to maximize, whether that's views yeah. or clicks or whatever. And humans are doing gradient descent as well. You're seeing people who are kind of, they start off perhaps being fairly moderate and then they realize that they get more clicks and more, more likes and more views because of the algorithm when they put out more radical content. And so the content that you're putting into the infrastructure is radicalized. The consumers yeah. are becoming radicalized because they've been sort of funneled and, and simplified and, and fed in one direction by the algorithm. And, yeah. the, the, you know, it, it's, it's on every side of the ecosystem. You're having this sort of feedback loop that, that's going on and, and accelerating this polarization, the content that's being generated and consumed and that people want to see because it's what they've just seen. And yeah, exactly. Uh, well, the, 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 I mean, and it's affecting the entire, the entirety of the system. I, I, I put in this little anecdote in the book. I could have, I think I could have written a whole chapter on it just because it's, it's so hard to believe and, and so complex in its structure. My wife is a travel writer and uh, she writes content for a lot of different people, largely long form discursive, you know, uh, interesting recommendations to people. However, uh, you know, she takes, she's a freelancer. So she takes jobs from lots of people. She got um, a particular job where she had to describe several places in, you know, travel blurbs. Uh, and she got a spreadsheet with the job that told her frequencies of words to put into each blurb, not only frequencies of single words, but frequencies of words adjacent to one another. Like you had to have the word exciting and mountaintop within two words of each other at least twice. <laughs> so she got a distribution of word specification for pieces about travel locations. And of course, what was this for? This was for search engine optimization. So effectively what they're trying to do is get the algorithms to pick these pieces out and place them more highly. And they were doing it by telling a human writer who has her own interesting insights about these places, what words to put in at certain frequencies. Now, if that's not the machine telling the man what to do or telling the woman in this case what to do, I don't know what is. And it, and it is illustrative of this grand feedback loop that we've created between the algorithmic curation of content and the way that um, people have to earn a living creating things. And uh, it's, it's, I find that one of, that was one of the more shocking events I've, I've, I've seen in recent years. And you can just imagine journalists have the same problem. And if you are somebody who writes articles occasionally for newspapers, which I've done, um, 
you don't get to write the titles in general anymore. The the editor writes them, and the edit and the editor wants the title to be a click through generating title. Mm-hmm. And um, so this is uh, you know this problem is is deep and complex. And and you're very right to point out the whole social feedback loop aspect of it. It's really important to realize that AI and real I are in a tight loop together. And if we don't realize which of those two parties needs to be calling the shots, we, we're going to end up in a bad situation. So, so this is the sort of irony that's showing up here is that as algorithms are increasingly coming to dominate things, not just the media ecosystem, but the financial world as well, and therefore they're influencing people's decisions, we and the sort of systems that we're creating through the way we interact with each other can end up becoming more predictable and more algorithm-like because of the sort of incentive structures that they're perpetuating and putting in place. And and I think I, I sense in your book, this is something that worries you, that it's going to create a world that is less hospitable for people who can't fit into boxes that the algorithm can quantify and understand, who who can't perform on the metrics that have been chosen as the important metrics, which inevitably leave things out. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that in this time when we have a more categorizing infrastructure that's trying to put people into boxes, we also have people breaking boxes so dramatically, like mm-hmm. people whose ideas you, the, the, there are a great many people now whose racial identity, they don't want to declare themselves black or white. You know, these are mm-hmm. meaningless categories in the first place. And they're de- defying society, trying to place them in those boxes. People who don't want to declare themselves as bi- as binary men or women. You know, people are fighting what is a emergent phenomena of greater categorization that's going on in people's lives. And that's great. Uh, the, the, the thing is, is that uh, one of the things I'm trying to, to point out, I guess, in the book is uh, when we talk about diversity and when we talk about bias, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to think of those in the traditional terms. And in fact, algorithms have reflected traditional biases, the traditional roles of gender, the traditional roles of black and white, uh, et cetera. Um, however, The thing that people need to realize is this simplification and generalization tendency is irrespective of what those current categories are. So if we, you know, change the categories, we're still going to get biases, right? And Mm -hmm. and the most important thing to realize is that that any of these descriptors that we put on people, man, woman, black, white, those descriptors are rough, extremely rough. And, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the thing about... Um, uh, you know, uh, race and gender are somewhat different in, in their character. I mean, race is an entire social construct. There, there are no races of human beings. There are only, except that there is a social construct of race. Right. And this comes through in uh, Angela Stiney's work really well. Absolutely, and and with regard to gender, yes, there are uh, there are some of us who have very different body parts from one another. But to correlate those uh, different body parts to uh cognitive behavior is is rubbish largely the science just doesn't hold up at all uh i would recommend uh gina rippon's book the gendered brain uh, as as well on this subject that debunks the all the gender brain uh science that's out there that really most of it's not very good science at all um but moreover although uh you know we think of of man woman as being uh, extremely distinct categories. The reality is, and in, in the biological reality, down to gross uh, physical detail, is that there are many people out there whose bodies are not strictly male, man, or woman. And moreover, if we think about the larger, you know, context of who you're attracted to, how you want to practice your personal life, there's a grand diversity. And and those the categories can be useful. It's, it's, it's perhaps useful to say if you're a man or a woman in, in some context. But we always have to remember any kind of simplifying category we place people into is fraught. And we have to be respectful of the fact that it's probably going to exclude and marginalize people who are different. And And that's a value that we need to take into our society but also that we need to take into our algorithmic infrastructure. And it, it, it's so easy, isn't it? You know, it's so easy, even from from a perspective of trying to think about this. It's when when you label something, you can dismiss it. You know, it's um, it, I, there's going to be people who 
feel like they're being pigeonholed along political lines. People who are going to say, well, you, you want to just categorize me as say, I'm a Trump supporter and this is what yeah. it must be like. And you're just yeah. shaving off so much detail from everyone's individual uh, lives and, and lived experience and so on. Absolutely. So, so, that, so, that, so that you can build up your own model of the world um, that is, is is nice for you and sort of rational for you and makes sense, but but destroys a lot of the complexity of the people that exist. And, you know, when we have Twitter and everyone's communicating in 280 character bursts with each other, that, that's also shaving exactly. off a lot of the complexity that, of, of people that we can deal with. Exactly. And this is one of the reasons I say to people on social media, um, try not to be the best way to as a at a grassroots level to try to change our interactions with computers is make sure that you're not behaving like an algorithm yourself and it requires mm -hmm. quite a lot of vigilance i'm probably guilty of the things i'm protesting against here uh, but but for instance when you share uh, uh an article try not to share on just the headline try to understand the article try to um understand the writer or the organization from which the article came so that you have greater co human content. So one of, one of the themes that's come through from your book then is this idea that we have social scientists who in some ways have physics envy, and I'm from a physics background, uh, my physicist friends have talked about this in the past, that people want to pretend that humans uh, can behave according to systems that can be specified in formal logic and mathematics and so on. And a big, a big critique that comes and, and, and relates in your book here is, is the critique of economics. And recently our show has, has been branching out into discussing economics as well. And e economics, a lot of mainstream economics wants to uh, understand sure. how humans will interact with each other economically. And to do that, it makes a lot of very, very simplifying assumptions about people, like, for example, how... Uh, humans have perfect information when they're making transactions. You have this homo economicus idea that humans are all just sure. rational actors running around maximizing our own self-interest, which is assumed to be something that we know and isn't a total mystery to us as it can feel a lot of the time. And economists also use metrics, which much like IQ, you know, may be correlated with some things or another but also miss a lot of stuff out and miss a lot of bias out. So we have, for example, GDP as a metric for understanding our economy, yeah. which em emits all of the work that doesn't contribute to GDP, but is still yeah. necessary for society to function. Work that is often traditionally foisted disproportionately on women, for example. Um, so, so there's lots of these issues that, that show up here. And how do you sort of view this, uh, this physics envy and this over quantification, I suppose, as it relates to economics? Uh, it's interesting. And I, I think physics may have motivated a lot of what happened here. And I think there's pretty good proof of this. Uh, I, um, uh, really, I, I mean, I, I talk about it a bit in my book. And uh, the book that I'd recommend is Eric Beinhocker's The Origins of Wealth. Uh, the first third of it, uh, he talks about the history of economics. And um, and he, he really gets it right. I mean, and there's certainly lots of entry points where Effectively, early economics and the kind of scientific methods associated with physics from modern physics from Newton on and then, then through modern physics uh, as well, all kind of parallel the developments uh, in economics, as do the developments in evolutionary biology. And I talk a lot about Darwin in the book as well. And, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a context there. And before Adam Smith's sort of times, um, Economics existed as a field of discourse, but it was largely a historical field. It was a backwards looking field that analytically looked at what had happened rather than trying to model and predict what would happen. And when as gradually from the time of Adam Smith on into eventually the 20th century, um, economics became a modeling science, a science about modeling what is happening and what will happen. And unfortunately, it is a social science, so it, it deals e explicitly with the uh, preferences and behaviors of people. So in order to be a modeling science, it's always had to make simplifying assumptions of pe about people. And, um, you know, those, those assumptions are, are, are useful, but often wrong. And, um, and, and you know, and like, like a lot of uh, quantitative social science, and economics is most certainly a, a quantitative social science now, all of them uh, are very useful, but need to draw in the idea that that their simplifications about people are just that, are, are, are massive simplifications. And um, we 
uh, I think we've done that insufficiently. I mean, uh, I, and even uh, let me talk about more modern economics that people talk about, like behavioral economics, et cetera. Uh, behavioral economics, uh, extremely interesting stuff. Kahneman's book's great. Kahneman's ideas are great. We take it and turn it into some guru science where effectively we're looking at people and saying, ah, you're demonstrating bias number 24 out of the list of statistical biases that, that, that people have come up with to explain human behavior. It's like we've turned something that says people don't behave as purely rational agents into some list of bias behaviors that, that were uh, – it's a different sort of model. And, and the thing is, is that people are complex. And uh, the quote that I use from statistician G.P. Box in my book that I love is, you know, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. And if we if we keep our minds on that in economics and in other areas, particularly around modeling people, you know, we'll have a more useful science. Mm -hmm. And but this sort of it's interesting how this ideology that not only should people sort of be these rational self-optimizing agents and so on, you've got this case where we're trying to force people as unquantifiable complex creatures into quantifiable mathematical boxes. And it influences how we want to yeah, run exactly. our societies because there's an idea, this sort of Hayekian neoliberal idea, I guess, that if you leave markets to be free because you have all of these... Uh, um, self-interacting complex parts that they will kind of relax into an optimal state and this this is an assumption yes. that goes into a lot of economic modeling and it's it's sort of it might be how a physical yes. system would behave that it would eventually you know if you have a pendulum it might eventually relax and and swing down to the point where it's not moving anymore but when you have a complex system of interacting people there's no guarantee that it will settle anywhere um anywhere understandable yeah. anywhere comprehensible you know, uh, I think the term used in economics, and I may get these terms out of order, but is dynamic stochastic general equilibria. Uh, is is and, and you think as a, as a physicist, think about how many qualifiers that is. It's like first of all, it's a dynamic equilibrium; it's moving around, so it's 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 a periodic attractor or some other complex attractor. Second of all, it's stochastic, so it's only mean value, and then it's general in some sense. So so effectively, you know, we've basically tried to take complex behavior and use everything, throw every mathematical simplification trick in the book at it in order to get it to a tractable form. And and, and the th the thing is, is that sure, are, are there tractable things? in, in uh, economics. Uh, sure. Are there highly intractable things? Yes. Uh, and, and, and in fact, um, the intractable things in economics are the most interesting things. And there, there are people who are studying things like the economics of innovation and complexity economics. And those are interesting things. But ultimately, what you have to know about those is they're, um, they're fundamentally about unpredictability, not about predictability. They're, they're, they're about the fact that we can't predict the ne next major a scientific innovation. Uh, we can't, I mean, we, we're in the midst of a, 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 a proof of this right now. No one knows when COVID will mm -hmm. end or if it will end. And no one knows even what ending looks mm -hmm. like. And so we're all kind of stabbing around in the dark to find ways, highly adaptive ways to deal with the world. And in fact, that's what humans do best. I mean, humans are great at tricky, adaptive, social, complicated ways of dealing with a highly uncertain future. We're great at that. Um, it's something that, that algorithms aren't good at yet. And I think we'll never be as good at as people because ultimately what do we mean by good? Well, we mean good for mm -hmm. people. So, so, and, and economics uh, is a great science. It's a, it's a, it's important science. It's a science that should realize its limitations just as all our sciences should. Uh, physicists, physicists are largely lucky, but then again, you've got the whole area of complexity science to deal with in physics. Uh, so you guys, physicists realize what the, the uh, upshot of real unpredictability is, even in systems that are made of billiard balls. Well, human being, human beings aren't billiard balls, you know? You know, the, this is the thing about physics. You see, we want to simplify everything to a simple pendulum or a simple harmonic oscillator right. um, because it's the one equation you can actually solve and get exactly. perfect predictability out of. Exactly. And most of physics is just built on this, you know, solving this equation dx 
And it, it all comes back to this because this is the one equation we can solve and everything else is chaos. The pendulum we understand, the double pendulum, yeah, you know? We don't, exactly. It chaotically depends on the initial conditions and it evolves in a chaotic way. And we should understand that the systems that we exist in as humans interacting with each other are obviously more complicated than a double pendulum. Sure. <laughs> and then they're far less likely to be tractably described by the mathematics of these simple equations. And, and, and the emergent objects that come out of this complexity, like thoughts, thoughts are emergent objects that come out of a highly complex system. They have to be treated as first class objects. You know, that, that you, you know, I think the realization of complexity science is some things are ir irreducible. And mm -hmm. um, so, so we, we live in a world not just of objects, but of ideas. And those ideas are first class objects. They don't break down into more primitive objects easily. And that relates directly to the idea of, of what we're saying about behavioral economics is, or any theory of behavior is effectively what you're trying to do is break down the complex behavior of human beings into simplifying behaviors, which can be useful, but can't be complete. And, and I, you know, I think the great message of complexity science that I don't think the profundity has been fully realized yet is it's a science that says science itself has fundamental limitations. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's fine. You know, that, that gives us a boundary to work with. Uh, and, and you were talking about physicists want to reduce things down to, you know, a second order differential equation uh, because they can solve it. Well, engineers, mm -hmm. you know, engineers are just physicists with, with uh, hairier backs, you know, and, 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 and effectively all they do is they solve these, um, these second order differential equations around a fixed point. And put huge safety margins around it. That's what you do. That's how you deal with the world, except in marginal, in a few marginal circumstances where you're doing something really wacky. But the thing is, is that's how you deal with the world. You make simplifications and generalizations about them. Fine. That's science. That's great. When you do it about people, show appropriate caution. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. And you know, so we're sort of talking about the the limitations of of not only science but also treating things mathematically and that i think was a real insight that sort of came in towards the end of your book which was different types of uncertainty because if you want to deal with things mathematically when it comes to uncertainty we think about bell curves we think about gaussians we think about saying okay there's a certain number of standard deviations and instead of dealing with a variable that's just a number we'll try and put some uncertainty on either side of it yeah. but what, what your book points out so brilliantly is that's not the only type of uncertainty that humans have to contend with. Would you would you sort of like to talk about some yeah. of the different uh, I, types of uncertainty we have I, to deal with? I, I draw on uh, work from Lane and Maxfield, who are um, uh, at the Santa Fe Institute and are, are econ economists, or were at the Santa Fe Institute when they wrote the paper that I'm, I'm talking about. But they talk about three kinds of uncertainty. They talk about truth uncertainty, which is the uncertainty in the answer of a well-described uh, proposition. And uh, the, the example I use in the book, and I've used it in lots of talks too, is, is uh, in a pregnancy test, when you get the plus or minus in the little stick in a pregnancy test, uh, the, the, the effectively you look at the, the, the instructions and it'll tell you the probability of a false positive is this, the probability of a false negative is that. So those are the... Th th those are uncertainties around a well-framed proposition, which is, are you pregnant or are you not? Uh, then there's semantic uncertainty, which is when um, you look at the plus or the minus in the little r reader, and you, you basically can't remember whether plus is pregnant or minus is pregnant. You then have semantic uncertainty. You don't understand the meaning of symbols in the world. You're uncertain about what symbols mean. And we deal with semantic uncertainty all the time. In fact, you deal with it in your visual field. Your, your brain is constantly looking at things and it's uncertain about the shapes and what they mean. And it's basically tr doing a maximum expectation solution to that. But, but that's a different kind of uncertainty to the uncertainty of a well-framed proposition, right? It can become a well-framed proposition, but initially it's not. And then finally, there's ontological uncertainty, and that's when you look at the uh, plus minus symbol and a symbol comes up like a skull and crossbones or, or some other symbol that you did not expect. Uh, that's when you're, you're actually unsure what things exist in the universe that you're dealing with. You know, is this a pregnancy test? Uh, is this a prank? Uh, has the world suddenly, have I entered bizarro world? You know, 
the, th- the reality oh, and a philip k dick story. yeah exactly <laughs> and and the thing is is that the i think human beings deal with ontological uncertainty like what things exist in the world on a daily basis and once again we could go back to COVID. is now we have something new that exists in the world that didn't apparently didn't exist you know some period of time ago and it disrupts everything it changes everything and we deal with those kind of things, not just on the level of a global pandemic, but on the level of waking up in the morning and going outside and seeing something we've never seen before, uh, meeting a person who has ideas that we've never under, uh, talked about before. And those that's the source of great joy and wonder if you cope with it in a non-brittle way. But if you treat all ontological and semantic uncertainty as if it's truth uncertainty, you can only do that f- through gross simplifications. And we get back to the issue of simplifying, generalizing, and categorizing the way that algorithms do and the way that they treat the problem of the real world's ontological and semantic uncertainties as uh, forms of different forms of truth uncertainty. And this is, this is the problem, as you say, with the algorithms, is that the only way they know how to treat it is by saying, okay, well... Uh, I'm a bit confused, but this is probably some sort of number somewhere. Yeah. You know, I, I think of classically the neural networks, probably the best thing that they're good at is recognizing objects. Um, so you, you'll feed it a whole load of image data and it will learn to recognize cats and dogs and gorillas yeah. and so on from yeah. training sets. But if you then, if you've only trained it to understand animals and you show it a car, it will probably come up sure. with something like, well, I'm like 51% sure that this is a gorilla, but I don't really know. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's a failure to recognize. It's like a category error. They don't even know the uncertainty that they're missing because they have no way of expressing it. And, and you provided an excellent segue that connects the idea of, of uh, this kind of way that algorithms deal with reality to the idea of bias. Because as you know, there was this example uh, where a... Uh, algorithm that be trained to label a wide variety of different kinds of images of animals, of of people, of objects, of cars at Google. They've been trained to label images, labeled a black couple gorillas. Now, mm-hmm. the algorithm uh, has no idea how loaded that, that idea was and how offensive it was. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, the thing is, 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 is that when Google went to fix it, the Wired magazine did a little study to find out what had they done to, done to this image labeling algorithm. This is, I think, three years after the initial report of this, you know, uh, ugly mislabeling of this couple. Um, they found out that they had removed the algorithm's capability to label any image as any one of the great apes. Right. So, so they, just, they took the words out. It couldn't say gorilla. It couldn't yeah. say chimpanzee. It couldn't say orangutan, et cetera. Why didn't they fix it in a, in a, in a way that clearly the visual features are there, right? You know, mm-hmm. uh, all you have to be do is, is, you know, no one mistakes in their right mind in general mistakes a, a, a picture of a human being for an ape. Human beings and apes look different. All human beings and apes look different. So why didn't they fix it that way? Well, because it was a huge black box neural network and that bias that it had inadvertently discovered through recognizing only socially decontextualized features of images uh, was buried somewhere in a deep learning neural network. So what they did is they just, you know, fixed it in some draconian way. And so it ties together many of the things we've talked about, the idea of biases, the ideas of black boxes, the idea of, of quantification, you know, ultimately those things come together and, um, and, you know, uh, I guess the, the, the big picture message out, of, message out of it is once again, you know, we, we ha- when we treat human beings with these simplifying engines, we have to do so with some caution. One area of AI that we have discussed regularly on this show is, has a degree of fascination for me is natural language processing, chatbots. Yeah. The Turing test has been this benchmark for AI that could kid someone into thinking it's a human that's never really been passed. Um, and this sort of goes into the history of AI where initially there was an idea that you'd come up with symbolic representations of ideas and now we've moved towards numbers and statistics. And we have these engines now, GPT-2, GPT-3, which can, through these statistical associations, generate some quite sort of astonishingly human-looking text 
and it's contributing, I think, to a lot of the misperceptions that people have about AI at the moment. Sure. Uh, which isn't helped by the fact that people call it AI and yeah. not algorithms. Yeah. But um, I mean, to, how, how do you view this natural language processing and these GPT two and three things, and the extent to which you can understand these concepts, uh, the, the words, the language that we use to communicate with each other, if all you have is statistical associations? Um, you know, you can you can generate pretty. <laughs> It's pretty easy. It, it would be pretty easy to teach someone to fake it and seem like they could write intelligently about almost any subject, right? It's not hard to teach somebody to do that. But the, the, the thing is, is that they don't have understanding of the subject. So if you, if you were to interrogate them and basically go into a, a loop with them, you pretty quickly get them to fall apart. Now, what GPT-2 and GPT-3 are doing is they are generating text uh, that text uh, can seem very human-like and seem knowledgeable about things. But if you start picking apart, if, if, you, if you start looking at it very carefully, they too fall apart very easily. Not as easily as, say, Eliza, the, the Turing test bot designed in the 60s on old AI did. You know, you can, you can make it sound foolish in about six, six iterations of, of asking it questions. GPT-2 is, is a bit more sophisticated than that, but it's also much more massive. But if you go looking at people who are querying GPT-2 carefully, uh, GPT-2, uh, I'm sorry, GPT-3 now, uh, GPT-3 um, pretty easily starts generating nonsense as well. Uh, the, the reality is, is that although it's very, it's a very convinc convincing fake, it still is a fake. It doesn't have real understanding of the things it's saying. It's just a good sentence, a, a damn good sentence generator. And um, I, I recommend the work of Gary Marcus on this. I don't have the paper uh, uh, title at hand, but he's done a recent paper on it where he's queried it. Uh, Melanie Mitchell did some nice work on this as well, uh, where she, she looked at uh, analogy making. So there, there are lots of articles coming out now where people are, are you know, taking a, a hammer and chisel to GPT-3. And, and the thing is, is, yeah, it's a very convincing sentence generator, but don't let its generation of sentences convince you that it understands what it's saying. It has no understanding of what it's saying. Understanding is a complicated human phenomena that we're uh, quite a far away from really generally addressing with algorithms. And I think this, because the reason I like to talk about this is there's this idea that, okay, GPT-3 is coming up with all these statistical associations between words, and that's how it constructs its sentences. And we have a tendency to anthropomorphize things that seem a bit human. Yep. And so, uh, of course, it's not helped by what you call wishful mnemonics yeah. in AI, where people want to talk about intelligence and learning rather than algorithms that adjust statistical parameters. Right. And I think we couldn't really leave without talking about common misconceptions around AI, which are rife at the moment. Uh, this idea of human level artificial intelligence, which a lot of people have written about, and I think there's, among some people, in some ways, an assumption that if you just build a complicated enough neural network, and if you just carry on doing what we're doing and add a few more layers and feed in enough data, something like consciousness will emerge from this system that's so complex. And I find that people like you, who are obviously a lot closer to the programming at the edge of machine learning and so on, are less likely to subscribe to this kind of view. So how, how do you think about this sort of idea of human level AI and and the, the discourse around it and do you think it's possible and do you think we're anywhere near there or, or not um so the the things that we associate with human intelligence uh are are you know have fallen into a number of categories um you know, we, we talk about general intelligence. We talk about sentience. We talk about consciousness. Uh, at one time, people talk, talked about spirit, right? Uh, to me, they're all code words for the same thing. They're saying a special human quality that only humans have that makes us human. And we put them in different boxes, intelligence being one of those boxes uh, with a lot of historical baggage associated with it, going all the way back to, to having a soul, as it were. And they're all special qualities that human beings have. Um, the thing is, is that human beings do have a special quality. It's called humanity. It's called being <laughs> what we are, being the thing that we are. And the question is, is there a separable human quality like intelligence or soul or sentience or consciousness that you can pull out of humanity and say, if we just had this in something else, 
we will have done magic, right? Uh, and and the thing is, is the closest we've ever gotten to describing any of those things is to say emergence. You know, there are emergent properties from physical systems. Things happen that are meta phenomena. You know, meta phenomena. Things things happen that the epiphenomena that 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 happen that are that are effectively uh, things we didn't expect to happen that are complicated and really uh, sophisticated. Now, do machines have epiphenomena? Absolutely, machines have emergent behaviors that are complicated that we can't understand and we can't break down. Complexity scientists sh shows that. Are those properties likely to be similar to some special quality of humanity that within we'd say, aha, we've solved this problem? Well, my assertion is, is that special quality of humanity is not just in our brains. It's not just systematic. It's in our entire selves. Uh, you know, we think with our bodies. We, we think with our society. And, and, and effectively, can is, is there a special emergent property that we'll, we'll look, point to and say, aha, we now have artificial intelligence. We now have artificial consciousness, artificial sentience, an artificial soul. And in my mind, that is uh, pretty unlikely. I think that our humanity is, is really bound up with us, not only as individual complicated organisms, but as, also as social organisms. Now, will we make machines that do unbelievable complicated things? Absolutely, we're on the verge of doing it already. Will they be things to which we want to assign rights and treat them as if they're like human beings? I kind of doubt it. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, that's a, that's a social phenomenon. That's a choice people make in saying, is this thing complicated? It doesn't have a quality to which I want to assign rights. I mean, you know, uh, we still have massive debates about the rights of animals, right? Um, and although I, I believe very much in animal rights, uh, they, they are not the same rights as human rights, right? And uh, when machine rights come along, are they going to have a, a special quality the way that a, a, a beautiful puppy or kitten or, or snake or beaver has? Um, I don't think anytime soon they're going to have that quality that we identify with as living beings. Um, so I think that the, the, I, I, I basically would say that uh, human level intelligence, um, you know, what do we mean by that? And if we mean by that mm -hmm. some special quality, are we anywhere near it technologically? I think we're not. It's fa it's a fascinating point you make that there's sort of a, a complex quality that emerges from a complex interacting system, like an economic system, you know, li like things that can seem to have minds of their own because they have so many different interacting parts that we might create systems yeah. that are complex enough for things to emerge, but will they be humanity? Well, no, because the only way you can get that is by recreating the precise complexity of the interacting system that is the sort of human brain and is the, the human society and the human mindset. And, and really not, not just, and not even just the brain, because uh, mm -hmm. another book I'll re recommend very highly is uh, Antonio Damasio's um, The Strange Order of Things, in which he talks about the idea that the brain in our heads is only one of the brains in our bodies. Uh, and the older brains, the, the brain that exists in your gut, which op operates to some extent autonomously from your brain, is actually much older than the brain in your head as uh, evolutionary uh, age. And, and, and these entities interact, these different brains interact, and are part of our thinking. When we say, my gut tells me something, that's a little more literal than most people think it is. So uh, the entirety of our bodies, our immune system, our peripheral nervous system, our, our gut, um, many other systems are intimately involved in one another and intimately involved in human thinking. So, so you know, uh, we, we are in many ways the entirety of ourselves as individuals. I, I want to sort of finish, and this, this isn't even necessarily a question for which I apologize, but it's just a reflection on uh, something in the book that, that struck me, which is, I mean, there are some beautiful passages in this book that I can't really do justice here, but it's this idea of form reflecting content, particularly when you link the mathematics of chaos theory and chaotic systems to, to creativity. And it, it draws in this idea of diversity as well, because that's when you have lots of these interacting parts that all function in a different way. And it's this idea that when systems are just on the edge of being predictable and comprehensible and understandable and explicable, that they can actually produce the most creative and fascinating and complex and important solutions and behaviors and sort of applying this to human society, which feels kind of quite chaotic at the moment. 
and a, a sort of an emergent complexity that is something that you can't really simplify to something that that algorithms can number crunch. And I feel like it, it comes through at the end of the book that to, to you, this is this is us and this is humanity and and what we're looking to preserve. And I mean, what, in in light of this, when when we're developing these algorithms and developing these systems that in a in a way sort of behave like us in in microcosm what should we be thinking about doing what should what should we do to preserve that that humanity that that sort of comes through um on the edge of this complex system it's it, it's it's not really a question as i said but it's, um... <laughs> yeah i mean um i thank thank you for getting it so well i think you you understood what i was trying to say in the in the book really really well and i i, I that is incredibly gratifying to me but this whole theory, edge of chaos kind of theory about adaptive systems and, and how, they, um, how they best function uh, at the edge of chaos, where they have structure, but that structure has maximized the adjacent possible, as Stuart Kaufman says. Um, that is a quality that I think we need to introduce into our algorithmic systems. We need to have try to encourage algorithmic systems to be at this edge of chaos because they will help us best there. And I think there is a body of science about how to analyze whether technical systems are existing at that space or whether they're crystallizing, uh, you know, think of social networks again and, and the idea that now we have these polarized uh, subnets effectively rather than having a boiling system of idea generation. And I think that can be measured and I think it can be contributed to by people and by algorithms. And I think that's a, a future science area that deserves a, a great deal of attention. Dr. Smith, I'd like to say, if, if it feels like we've covered a lot of ground here, it is because Rage Inside the Machine, your book, draws together so many different ideas from across different fields. We're talking about, it, it sort of purports to be a book about algorithmic bias, but really it's about so many different ways in which different aspects of society, economics and social systems and so on, have been constructed as, as well as algorithms. And I think, you know, people are going to get a lot of insights from reading this book, Rage Inside the Machine. So I'd like to thank you for writing it and thank you again for coming on the show. And thank, thank you very much, Thomas. It was great. Thank you for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction and thanks again to Dr. Smith for coming on the show. His book, Rage Inside the Machine, is one of the most brilliant texts you'll read on AI. A glorious mix between technical detail explained in a way that's not too oversimplified, personal stories and profound insight into this interface between computers and algorithms and, and humans. It's genuinely great. We just scratched the surface here, really, and I know I'll end up reading it multiple times for the full detail of what's been said. And just because it's also one of those books where you can kind of feel your brain expanding when you read it, in a good way, do get a copy. You can find that at RageInsideTheMachine.com, where you'll also find Rob's blog and some of his other appearances on podcasts if you're interested. He's also an occasional tweeter at Dr. R. E. Smith, so go check it out. As for us, of course, you know what you can do. The website is physicspodcast.com. There's a contact form there where you can get in touch with any comments, concerns, questions, things you liked, things you'd like to hear in the future, and so forth. You can donate there to the show via PayPal or subscribe to our Patreon. Both of those links are prominent on physicspodcast.com. There are currently over a dozen bonus and early release episodes for you to enjoy that you'll get straight away. Now, you won't be charged on the Patreon until a new paid bonus episode is released, and I tell people about that in advance so they know when they're going to be charged. And even then, the pledge can be as low as a dollar or two per episode, I think. So if you want to support people who create the independent content you enjoy, that's a good way to do it. Of course, another way to get involved and engage with the show is on social media. Twitter at PhysicsPod, Facebook, we have a physical attraction page and the science podcast group is also still going. And you can help us out by recommending the show to others, either by reviewing it or simply standing outside their window with a boombox and playing my dulcet tones rambling on about AI or climate change or asking questions that turn into ridiculous, confusing, run-on sentences like this one. All of that activity helps keep us going. Until next time then, please, take care.